nos movemos luego, nos vamos, pues déjame que vaya. So good morning, good morning, everyone. And uh, I just uh, want to welcome in the Faculty of Biology uh, and in the University of Oviedo because it's the first time, I think it's the first uh, uh, faculty uh, they visit in the University of Oviedo. The uh, two awardees with the, with the uh, Princess of Asturias Award uh, for uh, research uh, scientific and technological research for this year. So they are, uh, of course, very much connected with the, with the faculty, with this faculty of biology. So I think everybody is uh, today very much excited to hear what you have to say and also to see you here. Right, so I would like to thank the, the Foundation uh, Princess of Asturias to uh, give us the opportunity to have you here today. And I hope uh, you enjoy to be here in, in, in Asturias uh, yesterday and today and especially tomorrow. So uh, with that, I thank you all of you for being here today and pass to the, the uh, microphone or the, 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 the floor to uh, the dean of this faculty, uh, Jose Manuel uh, Ricordas, who is uh, recently has been promoted to full professor, so I, I like to congratulate him also. Thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you, Hector. Distinguished guests, authorities, colleagues, students especially, and members of the administrative services. In May, the panel unanimously decided to bestow the 2019 Princess of Asturias Award for Technical and Scientific and Research to Joan Chori from the United States and Sandra Mirna Diaz from Argentina for their pioneering contributions to our knowledge of plant biology, which are crucial in the fight against climate change and in the defense of biodiversity. Joan Chori has used Arabidopsis taliana as a model organism, revealing important aspects of the genes involved in functions such as sensitivity to light, the hormones that regulate plant growth, and the response to hydric stress. Her contributions regarding the role of phytochrome, a vegetable protein sensitive to red and infrared light, and the co-regulation of genes involved in photosynthesis are highly acclaimed. She also studies the development of plants capable of absorbing much more carbon dioxide from the air than normal plants and leads the Salk Institute's Harnessing Plant Initiative. Employing the most innovative genetic editing techniques, such as CRISPR, this research project combats global warming and hence climate change by optimizing the natural capacity of plants to capture and store carbon dioxide and to adapt to different climatic conditions. Sandra Mirna Diaz has specialized in botany and is also considered a reference figure in the field of ecology. She has participated in the development of a methodological tool to quantify the effects and benefit of plant diversity, biodiversity and the plant ecology of ecosystems and their exploitation for fuel, materials, medicines, dyes, food, water protections and other contributions, as well as the role of biodiversity in counteracting global change, for example, through atmospheric carbon sequestration. She has also participated in reports and activities carried out by both the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change and the International Convention on Biological Diversity. These are obscure times of uncertainty and fake news, but there should be hope. It is always better to light a candle than to cry in darkness. Young people demanding us action in the Fridays for the Future Initiative are lighting those candles. But we need to support them and enforce them with scientific knowledge and evidence. From molecules and genes to ecosystem services, embracing the levels of organization which are the subject of the natural science, the contribution of these two outstanding scientists gives a powerful tool for science to develop strategies and responses to global change, of which climate change is one of many hydra heads. And it is urgent that we act. Last year, Sylvia Earl, who was awarded the Princess of Asturias 2018 for Concord, told us that the time to act is now. Professor Chori, Professor Diaz, on behalf of the Faculty of Biology, please be welcome to our faculty, 
which from now on you may consider yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. my talk. <laughs> I don't Okay, okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, <laughs> I'm just using this computer, I guess. Okay, let me start by thanking you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here, and I hope I can tell you something inspiring. And um, I also want to thank the committee and the jury that chose us for this award. I'm, I'm honored to share it with Sandra. And, um, and it's been a great week here o overall. I'm not used to being a celebrity. I went out yesterday for lunch, you know, and uh, everybody wanted a picture with me. And I was like, really? Why would you want a picture with me? You know? And so anyway, but it was kind of fun, you know, and it's fun to do it with your family. And so my family's here and some friends. And so all of that's been really a lot of, it's been very special. It's going to be a great memory for me. And so, thank you. Okay, so about 35 years ago, I decided I wanted to do plant genetics. And so I was a postdoc at the time. And so I started working on this little mustard weed, Arabidopsis. And at that point in time, we couldn't do much with that plant, you know, because it, it doesn't even have a common name, okay, because no one cared about it. And so, you know, we, kept, we continued to work on it, et cetera. And um, I did that for 35 years, basically. And a couple of years ago, I decided I just couldn't sit in my office anymore and think about the old problems the way I had been thinking about them. Because this whole climate crisis was just beginning to loom really big. And it should have been looming before that in my mind, but I, it wasn't. But I, th I woke up that day or whatever, I kind of had an epiphany. And so here I am, you know, working in a brand new area at the end of my career. Okay, so let me figure this out. Okay, let's see. So the title of my talk is Harnessing Plants to Fight Climate Change. All right. And my talk is, I'm going to try standing, see how I do. All right. My talk is inspired by the person who founded my institute, Dr. Jonas Salk. And Jonas Salk basically um, eradicated polio from the earth. You know, right around the time I was born was when the first kids were getting that. Oh, I don't have to. I'm sorry. Okay, let's try this. All right. And so here's a couple of quotes from Jonas. This one inspires me on the upper right hand corner. Hope lies in dreams and imagination and in the courage of those who dare to make those dreams a reality. I think that's a good mantra for a scientist because, you know, we all have, are in search for, of the truth, right? And so. I think, you know, that helps a lot to have that quote, something I walk over every morning when I come into work. But this was this quote that I think is relevant for this initiative. And it's, our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors. And so I think, you know, I have two kids. 
I have to leave the world in a better shape than what I got it from my parents, I think. And so this is what I want to work on now and try to be part of the solution to a major global problem. All right. All right, so here's, here's the urgency and here's the problem. We have too many people, we don't have enough land, and we have ecosystem collapse. And so this is one example of what the issues really are, right? So in 1961, the year Sandra was born, I learned from her bio. Anyways, um, the Earth had, you know, 3.1 billion people. We now are going to have in 2050, 9.4 billion people. And so we have less land per person, and all those soils are really depleted of organic carbon and many nutrients. How are we going to tackle this huge problem, and how are we going to let this competition for land, you know, let us get past this crisis, right? Because people have to have a place to live, and they need food to eat. And the atmosphere is warming because of the way we burn fossil fuels. So all of this is in competition with each other. So any solution you might have has to take all those things into account, I think. And that makes it a much more difficult problem. Okay. So CO2, carbon dioxide, is the bad guy usually in the news, right? But as plant scientists, and those of you who are here who are plant scientists, you can see the good side of CO2. CO2 is not just a villain, right? It actually is important. It's basically the source of all food on Earth, and it's what we're all made of, carbon. Okay, so if you look at CO2, you can see some good news, and you can see some bad news. And here's the bad news first, I think. All right. Oh, here's some, this is just a reminder about photosynthesis. I'm sure you all know what it, what it is, but it's just when you take, when plants suck up CO2, they mix it with water and, and they use the energy from sunlight to split that water and then you get out oxygen and you get carbon fixed in an organic uh, molecule, like a sugar, okay? And so, so plants are naturals at, at dealing with this problem of too much CO2 in the atmosphere, which is what's causing the atmosphere to overheat, and also which, which is causing the climate crisis, ultimately. It's one of the molecules causing the climate crisis. All right, so here's the numbers, OK? We have every year the Earth has this carbon cycle. And so 746 gigatons of CO2 are captured by nature every single year, and another 727 is released. And so when this carbon cycle is working well, we, like you can see, we have a little bit more captured than what, than what the Earth wants to release. This all stays in equilibrium and everything is fine. All the other cycles work well too, like the sulfur cycle, the phosphate cycle, et cetera. So, but now we have this human input. And that human input is another 37 gigatons. And when you look at the numbers, so here we go. You know, you have a bunch of gigatons being captured, a bunch being released, you add some more from human activity, and now you have 18 gigatons excess that the Earth doesn't know what to do with it, okay? And that's what's causing global warming, which is causing climate extremes, okay? But the good news in these numbers is that that number, 746, is way bigger than 18. That says that plants and other photosynthetic organisms and other things that Mother Nature does with some rocks and things has the capacity, the Earth has the capacity to actually deal with that 18 gigatons. That's what it said to me. It got us to keep working on this project. All right. But there's a, there's a glitch in all this. You know, it doesn't just work so easily. And the, and the problem is, is that plants have a normal life cycle. A lot of plants that are grown on the earth actually are crops and they're annuals. And what happens at the end of the growing season, 
The farmers till their soils, and then all that decomposition of the plants and also decomposition of animals and some other activities releases all that CO2 back up into the air. So our idea was, as a, as a group of five plant scientists at the Salk Institute, was that we would ask the plants to take some of the carbon that they normally fix into sugars and fix it into a polymer that's recalcitrant to breaking down by microbes. And I'll show you which, what, what that polymer is in just one second. Okay, so this is our initiative. I didn't show this one last night. But anyways, what we have is a three-prong initiative. And it's called the Salt Harnessing Plants Initiative. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is this, this program here called CROPS. And that stands for CO2 removal on a planetary scale. And we're using crop plants to do that. Okay, so it kind of made sense to have an acronym called CROPS. We also have one called CPR, run by Joe Noel. And that's called CPR for Coastal Plant Restoration. And that's trying to breathe new life, you know, into, into things like mangrove and, um, whatever, <laughs> the grass, seagrass, and what else are we doing? Typha, you know, there's a bunch of these coastal plants that actually are great carbon stores. And then the third initiative is one we're not really working on yet, but it's plants for future climates, and that's if all these other initiatives fail, you know, we're gonna need to have plants that can grow and what our future climate is gonna be. All right, so crops, is the biggest program we have, and that's because we got funding from TED, of TED Talk fame, you know. And TED runs this project called the Audacious Project, and we were picked as finalists, and we raised $35 million from them this year. And we just got the money in July, and we're still hiring people to work on this project. But we now have the money to really give it a shot, you know. So if we blow it, we blow it, but I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to blow it, but if, if, we, if we can't do it, then we also know that that's information that you know, we know. All right, so that's the project. That's the one that has the money, all right? So to do this project, we, we reasoned that we only needed to change just three traits, okay? So we need the plants to make more root. And we need more root because we need to get more carbon fixed and stably incorporated into soils, which is where all that organic carbon is missing from. And so we need more roots and we need roots that grow deeper. And deep roots are good because there's not much oxygen down there. And that soil tends to be where a lot of um, rich carbon can be stored for longer periods of time. And then we also need to get plants to make more recalcitrant polymers. And the one we were interested in is suberin. And suberin is basically a big macromolecule and has a really long chain fatty acids in it. Let me show you what it looks like on NMR. All right. Oh wait, so yeah, you might want to know what suberin is. All flowering plants make suberin in their roots. Some of them make suberin in some other tissues. So if you look at your compost pile, you might see some things live there a long time. And those are these recalcitrant polymers that plants make, right? And so here you can see all those orange rinds. Citrus rinds are suberin, potato skins are suberin, you know, cork, oak, bark is suberin. And they're not all exactly the same. So part of what we're doing is also, you know, some of the basic studies that you have to do so you can do the translational research. All right. And so this just shows an, an NMR of suberin from cork, cork oak found from a tree growing in San Diego's Botanical Garden. And up above there is a commercial white cork. So cork is also super. And so, so that lot is cool. They look pretty much the same, but they're not exactly the same. And here's the structure from uh, solid state NMR of suberin in from the cork oak bark, okay? And this is a really cool structure because everywhere you see a black dot is a carbon, 
All right, so this molecule is storing hundreds of carbons. And in, in the middle part, there's no oxygens at all. Because oxygens are what microbes look for when they want to decompose a plant, right? And so all those red dots are the oxygens. And so you, you might imagine if you look at this molecule that the middle part is really recalcitrant to break down, and it is. And the ones on the edges, the you know, these, these structures on the edges are going to be broken down by microbes, and they seem to be not in soil. Okay, so that's suberin. How do we make the plant make more suberin? The plant doesn't make much suberin because suberin is like a seal, right? If you have suberin, you can keep water out if the plant has too much water already and it's waterlogged, or you can keep it in. You know, so, and you, so you can actually do a lot with suberin. It keeps pathogens out, et cetera. So plants making more suberin, you might think, would be more resilient. But what we learned is that when plants, if you let the plant make more suberin where it wants to make more suberin, it basically cuts itself off. And so it was, they, plants were starving themselves to death. So let me show you. <laughs> I think I have a cartoon of that. And so we need to make more suberin. And we need to, have, and you can imagine many bottlenecks in that pathway, right? And so there might be bottlenecks of biosynthesis, might be bottlenecks of transport on an ABC transporter, which has to bring the monomer to the membrane. And there might be bottlenecks on the polymerization of the monomers. And so there are, there's MIM transcription factors that are actually regulating the whole super and biosynthetic pathway. And so you can just misexpress one of those, and you can make the plant make more super. But where the plant makes it is not a good place I mean, when you do that. So let me see. OK, so here I said location, location, location. So on the left-hand side there, you can see this red tissue is a stain for suberin in this cartoon. And that's suberin in the um, in, in an internal layer. I know its name, I forgot. I don't know why. OK, but in, in, if you let the root get older, you can see that you can make suberin out there. And th that's the woody part of the root. And that's a tissue called periderm. And periderm is the place where the plant can put a lot of suberin and not starve itself. So that's an example about how we're trying to make more suberin. And, and just to wrap it off as our model, tissue, and it's tissues, the root tissues. All right. And that tissue, the first tissue was endoderm. I don't know why. It couldn't be that. All right, so, all right, so we want more and more and more in location matters. Location, 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 as they say in the United States. And so that's how we're doing that. That's the main thing we need to do. But we also need to affect the levels of suberin indirectly. And the way we're doing that is by making more root and making deeper root. And I think those problems are actually simpler to solve. Let's just take a quick look at that, and I'm almost done. All right. So here's an example of, how, of an idea we had. Where we could take a plant hormone and make the gradient steeper between the source tissue, which is the leaf, it's where the plant is fixing carbon into sugars after photosynthesis. And then this root is a sink tissue, OK? So the idea is we overproduce this hormone in the mesophyll layer of that leaf. And we made the gradient steeper. And by doing that, we get more roots. And that looks like this. In a rabbit like In a rabbit up. So that plant on the right is making about twice as much root as the plant on the left. And so that root has more carbon in it, hopefully, and we'll have more of it in suberin when we make those measurements. And so, so we actually did that experiment in the opposite way. And what we did was we made, it a, made the root a better sink by taking a catabolic enzyme for that hormone and like down-regulating it in the root. So we kept the levels the same in the shoot, but we still have a steeper gradient. And the result is exactly the same. You get more root. So that, that told us something about biology. This is a plant hormone that all plants have, and it's necessary for their life. And so we think we can take a trait like that and do this in crop plants, which are taking much more land 
up in, on the earth than a rabbit else's and use it to, to have a global effect on CO2 in the atmosphere. All right, so that experiment, I think it's good. So that's two ways, but one, it's basically one pathway probably for how you might get more roots. But we have four different ways, we think, to make more roots in our model plants. And I'll just show you one more. All right. Here, here's the experiment. And this plant here, the third one from the left, is making more root than the wild type. You can see wild type right there. And these are all single plants. OK, so what, what has been done in this experiment is that we've overexpressed a microRNA. And this microRNA downregulates the expression of a whole bunch of genes. And when you do that, you get more root. And when you get more root, you get more shoot. I think, but this, actually, this microRNA in that plant has been overexpressed directly in both the shoot and the root. That's what that means. So the top line is shoot, and the bottom, and the bottom is root. And so these are graphs, OK? So on this second plant, we have a wild-type shoot, and we have an overexpressed microRNA in the root. And what you can see there is that plant makes more root as well. And so the root directly can affect this, the root development. So this, these plants make a lot more root. And so that's another way to get more root, and I won't tell you any more about that. But I think that trait is going to be pretty easy. And so we'll see how we go with that. And then we won't need deeper roots. All right. And so here's the deeper roots. We have wild type. These are just natural isolates of the Arabidopsis harvested from around the world. And you can see here that this is a root that's meandering along the surface. And you can make an, an edited mutation in just a single gene. And that is also a hormone gene. It's an oxygen gene that affects where oxygen is in just one part of the plant. And when you do that, the plant doesn't have a proper gravitropism response. And all the roots grow deep. Here we go. And you can see it's a wild type. And here's the deep roots of where they oh, I think it's <laughs> all right. <laughs> the roots these, those little red lines are roots because they're being stained or polarized. I don't know why. <laughs> here's the gene in it. And you can see those roots and this is a cut through a pot of soil. And you can see those roots are growing deep and not meandering along the top. The angle has changed the angle of lateral well, roots. Okay. And so it turns out there's multiple ways to get deep roots too. Okay, so those two traits I think are going to be pretty easy. So now what do we have to do? We have to take these traits, stack them up within a single plant. Because if these are affecting separate pathways, you can imagine you get a really big response in those plants. And then we have to find these genes in the crops. And then you get those crops all edited and put them back out. You know, so, I'm sorry. All right, so that's what we're doing right now. Doesn't like that gene. Okay, this is just to remind you what our experiment is as I close the talk now. And so we're going full cycle with plants. And what I mean by that, you know, death is part of the cycle, but we want these plants to die and stay partly in the soil. So farmers are not going to be allowed to till these plants, especially the roots. We want the roots to grow down deep and keep that and break up into particles like roots will. And then together with the soil, keep more recalcitrant carbon in that soil, which is in which is almost all the soils on Earth are depleted of organic carbon. OK, so what we're looking for here is more suverin per plant. That's our metric, right? And so that tells us, you know, if we're really making more suverin, then we can look at that field or site in a trial and see if we're actually sequestering more carbon there for longer periods of time. And the answer to that question is not going to be known until we actually do the experiment. And so we'll see how that goes. But here's why I'm hopeful. OK. 
All right, I'm fine. I'm hopeful for, for this reason too. So if we, if we look at the land that six major crops are, are taking up and they take up, these six major crops, which are outlined there somewhere, I think, anyways, um, take about 960 million hectares of land. Okay, so what we're looking at here is that we can get a certain percentage of the acreage to be covered by our crops, which have these genes which alter traits that are important for carbon sequestration, that we can actually, and then we get a certain amount of carbon put into this new super we're making. You can do a calculation, and that's between these white lines, that says we can get a 20 to 40 percent reduction of the carbon dioxide that humans are putting up each year, that's 20 to 40 percent reduction of 18 gigatons of carbon. That's a global experiment, okay? And that amounts to four to eight gigatons, which gigatons of CO2. And we can do this cheap because the infrastructure is there. The agriculture is supported by governments and we just have to get onto it. Okay. And the co-benefits of superized deep roots, and here's some of them. It's going to improve soil health. Everyone thinks that who works on soil. It's going to increase resistance to drought, flooding, and disease, and improve water and nutrient use efficiency, less fertilizer, and hopefully we get increased yield from these plants. So that's a, we have to get the farmers to want to buy these seeds, right? And so that's the big challenge. All right. Why now? So those 30 years I spent in my lab, this is what we were doing, right? We were studying plant hormones and how they change in response to the environment. And it was mechanism-based studies, and that's what's helping us get these traits figured out fast. And so we had the molecular genetics revolution when I was a postdoc here in the 80s. And so we started to learn the function of many genes in plants. And then in the 2000s came the genomics revolution. Now you can sequence any plant, and now with precision breeding and editing, you can actually make any mutation in any plant. Every plant now becomes a genetic organism, and that's really important, right? Because it, it just it frees up the ability to ask so many questions in which you can get a clear answer. And I think that's really important. All right. <laughs> molecular biology means plant breeding meets synthetic biology. We've got all the buzzwords in there, so hopefully you know, the government might fund us, but they don't have a panel that's studying this. Okay, we have success and challenge points. I have to skip these. We, we're going to be growing a lot of our plants out as we go. We know that. That's why we have to have multiple ways to do each of these traits, because we're not sure which ones are going to work and in the different crops, or if any of them will work. All right, and the biggest issue is here, the rate of super and decomposition across different soil chemistries. I mean, we have to get numbers for that. And so we actually have a study we're setting up with UC Davis. They're already running their study all over the state of California, and they want to add our superized roots to their study to see what, what you get in addition, or if you get nothing. We need to know that, right? And so, all right, here's why. Okay. This is why I'm hopeful, because if you look in peat, which is one of the best storage places for suberin, I mean, for stabilized carbon, what you find is suberin, basically. Okay, so these little particles of soil, and here's suberin in cork on the top, Here's the, what you find in peat, and it really looks very similar. And so we think suberin is going to be a good molecule to do this. We just have to wait and see. And I want to thank all my colleagues who helped do all these experiments that I talked about. They're on the next slide, and here's why we think we can do it. Why we think this is a, a solvable problem, at least partly. By our, by our technology, and that's because it has all the right buzzwords that people are looking for in the IPCC. It's global and it's scalable. We don't have to have 80% of the crops, you know, 
be grown as, as, as these special crops until, you know, we can just do it as we go. And so that's what we're going to do. Scalable, it's iterative, meaning you can put this, these traits into any plant, I think. And it's distributed, meaning plants grow all over the world. And so we have all the environments covered. <laughs> we have no new infrastructure. And the last thing is plants have a track record at a planetary scale for modifying the Earth's atmosphere, right? And so plants have been involved, the land plants alone, and this is much later than all the other photosynthetic organisms, have been evolving for 450 million years. So we should give them a chance to do their job, right? Because that's what they've evolved to do, is take up that CO2. We don't need to build direct air capture machines, I don't think, as long as we have plants and trees, et cetera. Around. Okay. Okay. Here's the people who are working on the project so far. As I said, we're still hiring people because we just got a real big infusion of money. It's kind of scary to have that much money, you know, because if you blow it, you've blown it, you know, and so it all comes back to you. And so I'm a little worried about it. But philanthropy has done a big part of this kind of approach to science, so you can't underestimate people who have money who also have vision, you know, and have patience, not just for high tech, but for things that take longer. Because our, our study is going to take about 10, ten years. And that's a long time, right? So you have to be patient. And I think I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I went on too long. But, <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, muy buenos días a todos. Esta es la única parte de la charla que voy a dar en castellano, <laughs> pero quería hacerlo en el, en el idioma que tenemos en común. Estoy realmente, como decía Joan, estamos totalmente orgullosas y muy emocionadas por todos estos honores y por el recibimiento fantástico de toda la comunidad de Asturias. Y yo tengo, estoy particularmente encantada de tener una oportunidad académica con todos ustedes. ¿sí? Eh, voy a hablar de pie porque me siento más cómoda, pero no sé si el, el micrófono anda bien. Suficiente. Ah, fantástico. ¿Me oyen bien? Bueno, eh, si por ahí me distraigo con el micrófono, eh, simplemente levantan la mano así sin pudor y yo sé que estoy haciendo algo mal con el micrófono. Y puede ser que no entiendan, pero si no es por el micrófono, bueno, ahí no levanten la mano porque no hay nada que pueda hacer. Bueno, este... Now I'm, I'm going to shift to English. Um, one of the most remarkable things of uh, plant life on Earth is its remarkable variety of form and function. And this has uh, captured the imagination of people for a long time. But at the same time, if we want to understand them and manage them, we need to find some general patterns, a few, a small number of general principles underpinning all this fantastic diversity. And this quest to find a few general patterns underlying the overwhelming diversity of plant form and function on Earth has been a focus of interest for a very long time, hundreds or thousands of years. And Apparently, the first to start this trend was Theophrastus in ancient Greece. 
Theophrastus was considered the father of botany, and apparently he was a man of simple and clear ideas. He didn't like details. He said, okay, there's only two kinds of plants, herbs and trees. And maybe if you really press me, I will give you shrubs, but don't bother me with more complexity than that. And he was, because of that, the first lumper in ecology. And the lumping tradition in ecology has a, a long line of successors, eminent successors of Theophrastus, including some prominent ones all over the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. All of them interested in the general uh, adaptive specialization patterns of plants. And these ideas have been put to the empirical test a very large number of times. There are very many examples looking at this uh, recently. I apologize if your study is not here, because I, I started populating it, and it was so, there was such a proliferation of studies that the, the, the slide was too crowded, so I stopped. But anyway, despite the very large number of studies, studies that go beyond local floras and beyond individual organs are really scarce. So a few years ago, with some colleagues, we detected this gap here, and we decided to go for this gap. We wanted to identify general plant specialization patterns at the level of the whole plant at, at the global scale. And we were interested in all three dimensions of what Darwin called plants struggle for existence. That is growth, survival, and reproduction. Now, to make this operational, we needed proxies. We needed a small number of traits that were so fundamental that together they could encapsulate all three dimensions and at the same time, they would be available or easy to measure from scratch in a very large number of plants worldwide. So we settled for plant height, the mass of spores or seeds, the mass per area and the nitrogen content of leaves, the size of individual leaves, and the stem specific density. As you see, all these traits are pretty straightforward, uh, but at the same time, they are very fundamental both for plants to responses to the environment and plants' effects on other trophic levels. But however simple these traits are, putting together a worldwide database of them was not trivial. It couldn't have been done five years ago. We managed to do it because of TRI. Um, have you ever heard of TRI? Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a good time for me to do a little bit of uh, advertising. Um, TRI is the first and biggest communal plant trade initiative. Uh, it's a global big bag of information on plant traits. And although we started 10 to 12 years ago, so it's a reasonably young initiative. We managed to have more than 10 million of trade entries for a huge number of plant taxa, and we have already served more than 7,000 projects worldwide. So we are pretty proud. If you are interested in knowing more on how TRI can help you, you just let, ask, let me know after, after the talk. In our case, TRI served us pretty well. And we managed to put a database, including plants from all growth forms, from all populated continents and climate zones. And altogether, there were something like more than 46,000 plant species of varieties belonging to more than 400 families. And we managed to catch 
some of the most extreme values of these fundamental traits known to science. So, although we don't claim to have covered all the variety of these traits on Earth, we think we are pretty close, especially in terms of com uh, contemplating these streams. What we were trying to do with this, what we wanted is to construct or less than construct, to, to characterize, to identify the global trait space occupied by all vascular plants on Earth. If you think of a hyper-dimensional volume with six dimensions, each of the six dimensions, one of these traits, what would be the shape of that volume and how will be the occupation by species of that volume? That's what we wanted to do in essence. So using convex hull technology, we first try to construct what we call the observed trace space, the real one, the one we, we, we have today on Earth. And we compared that observed trace space with at least four null models. And this is how the observed trace space occupied by all vascular plants on Earth looks like. I cannot show you the space in all its six-dimensional glory because we cannot depict six dimensions, so I need to show only three dimensions at a time. But we have a shiny application um, connect to the, to the paper, and there you can play with different combinations of, um, of traits and also the comparison between the observed one with the uh, null hypothesis. This observed trait space was significantly different from all the trait models, all the null models, excuse me. Meaning, strong concentration on plant form and function within the space, meaning there are strong constraints and trade-offs in the essential design of vascular plants. I'm aware that doesn't surprise you, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time it was tested at the world scale. But this was only the outer shell of the volume. What about the occupation by species within it? To answer that question, to see whether it was uh, homogeneously uh, occupied by species like a blob or species were strongly concentrated in particular areas, we did something extremely simple. We just ran a straightforward PCA, principal component analysis, and we found that 74% of the total trade variation in all the multidimensional space was captured by one plane, plane, just one plane determined by axis one and two, the only axis that capture significant non-redundant information. And we call this plane the global spectrum of plant form and function. Here, uh, you probably cannot see the dots, but each dot is a species, is the global average for the species in the world. Right? There's no intraspecific variability in this graph. And the vectors are, of course, they represent the strength of the different traits in determining the plant's position on the plane. Um, and so here you have high nitrogen, low nitrogen, robust leaves, flimsy leaves, tall plants, tiny plants. Right? Now, tr rather than trying to understand each axis um, separately, we like to look at the spectrum as a plane. And here there are two major axes. One is this one, that is, a, is an, axis, an axis of uh, size of whole plants and plant organs. It goes from really small plants with tiny leaves and leaves 
all the way to really tall plants with large leaves and leaves. And the other major axis in the plane is this one. It's an axis of economics. It goes from high investment in construction versus fast assimilation and growth. Are, if you, any of you are familiar with the leaf economic spectrum, by the way? Okay, for, for you who are familiar with the leaf economic spectrum, this is basically the leaf economic spectrum, published by, by some colleagues a few years ago. And it goes from robust, conservative leaves that invest a lot in carbon. They are poor in nitrogen. They take forever to be formed, and they, they stay forever on the plant once they are formed. They are highly defended. All the way to leaves which are very flimsy, very rich in nitrogen, and they are displayed very quickly, and they, live, they, they just basically live fast and die young. Acquisitive leaves. This plane is the first global picture of essential plant diversity, essential functional diversity of plants. Um, the first, the best way to imagine it is, imagine is the, the galactic disk of the Milky Way. If you look at the, if you think of the Milky Way, the Milky Way is um, kind of tilted. And instead of being a, a blob, instead of being a really cloudy and blobby and spherical galaxy, is rather flat. Most of the stellar mass of the Milky Way is concentrated in a very flat disk. In a similar way, the functional space occupied by vascular plants living today on Earth is rather flat. It looks more like a pancake like than a, a spherical shape. Let me show you some familiar plants which are in the frontiers of the spectrum so you have a better picture of what's there. In this extreme is the Brazil nut, la nuez de para. On the other extreme, I put this in, in honor to you, John, it's Arabidopsis. <laughs> Now, John told me that she expected it to be a rather boring kind of middle-of-the-road plant. It's not. It's super specialized there. It lives in a distant corner of the functional galaxy. Uh, the centroid is here, so you can imagine. Okay. Then here you have a really conservative, uh, dense, uh, with very dense tissues, um, gymnosperms, like the monkey puzzle, Araucaria all the way to really flimsy plants, mostly submerged aquatics, like Utricuralia e Miriophilum. At this stream, extremely conservative uh, members of the Proteaceae family. These are uh, mostly restricted to the southern hemisphere, like uh, South Africa, like Australia, and a few other places in the earth all the way to these plant, plants, which are very tender but very toxic, like uh, Lestramonium, Datura, Stramonium. Uh, and here, plants with tiny leaves, uh, very uh, stress tolerant, like uh, Los Bresos, Caluna, all the way to the sacred lotus. So this is more or less to have an idea of what's there, what are the bearings in this um, map. Now, if Theophrastus was looking at us, we said, well, but that's starting to be too detailed, you know, too anecdotal, too many special cases. Tell me something really general about the, the spectrum itself. So the first thing you, he probably wanted to know is where are the herbs and where are the woody plants? Well, here they are. Um, are herbs and woody plants fundamentally different in terms of essential functional design? The answer is yes and no. 
you can see the Goody and Herbaceous plants are clearly uh, segregated along axis one. Not surprisingly, Goody plants are taller than, than Herbaceous plants. Their stems are, of course, denser, and they tend to have larger leaves and seeds. So that's nothing surprising there. Theophrastus would have been just delighted. Yeah. But there are some fundamental uh, commonalities between the Goody and Herbaceous plants that he probably didn't suspect. You never know. But um, if you look at, this is the classical bivariate plot that one does when one wants to talk about the leaf economic spectrum. You plot uh, the leaf mass per area, so how robust a leaf is, versus the leaf nitrogen content. And you get the classical um, uh, direct um, a, a kind of a opposite link, the, the classical diagonal. But what is interesting here is that the slope and the elevation of the curve it is uh, non-significantly different between herbaceous and goody plants. Meaning there's something really fundamental about leaf investment, about these two uh, variables combined all over the world of the vascular plants. So this is what they have in common that we didn't know before. On the other hand, this is another plot. Here you have height of the whole plant. And here you have, again, leaf mass per area. We all know that, on average, woody plants have higher mass per area. They have more robust leaves than herbaceous plants. That's not very surprising. But what's interesting is that this, leaf, this higher leaf mass per area tends to be associated with being goody, not with being bigger. If you see, goody plants are not only, uh, on average, have more um, robust leaves, but at any given height, right? At any, at any given height, herbaceous plants tend to have lower leaf mass per area, that means flimsier leaves, than woody plants. In other words, a leaf doesn't really care whether it's hanging from a tall plant or a short plant, but it does seem to know where, whether it's hanging from a woody or herbaceous plant at any given height. And that was, for us, really, really interesting. We, don't, we are not very sure yet what it means, but we thought it was really cool. Okay, now if you, uh, you know, you're done with Theophrastus, we think that we found some interesting things about uh, how this functional space got occupied during evolution of plant life on Earth. If you look at major taxonomic groups, you see that the gymnosperms occupy a very restricted corner of the, of, um, of the plane. On the other hand, the angiosperms occupy the whole range, including the range of the gymnosperms. This sort of suggests that the angiosperms uh, taking advantage of all their evolutionary adaptations, like uh, completely different vascular anatomy and more acquisitive leaves, and altogether a more acquisitive lifestyles, managed to, and, and smaller seeds, managed to occupy areas of the spectrum that have been beyond the reach of the gymnosperms, at least the gymnosperms that are alive today. But within the angiosperms, we can also find some interesting trends. Now I would ask you to pay a bit of attention to the color overlay. The color overlay is a probability density map, meaning that these areas which are very pale are um, occupied by a very low number of species, comparative low number of species. And 
uh, these really red hot areas, functional hotspots, mean there are a lot of species that have more or less the same combinations of traits. You can see here that most of our evolutionary history in terms of number of species, not biomass, are concentrated in only two hotspots. One at the core of the herbaceous species distribution, and the other is uh, within the woody species distribution, but slightly eccentric. This is mostly trees. Again, the to do have liked it very much. Uh, now, these two hotspots are occupied by members of many phylogenetically distant families and orders, meaning that these hotspots are not just the product of a particular lineage going crazy with the speciation for no reason at any particular time in evolutionary history, but rather these trait combinations seem to be successful combinations found repeatedly over the evolutionary history of the angiosperms. So we thought that was cool. But equally interesting for us are these uh, border, these fringe areas, these white areas. You can also picture this as a topography, right? You can picture a topography where these are the peaks and these uh, white areas are the valleys. These areas are interesting because why they are empty? One reason is just biomechanics. You cannot really hang a big, big, big seed from a tiny plant or having a huge flimsy leaf uh, on top of a very tall tree and because the leaf will collapse altogether immediately. But there are a lot of biomechanically viable combinations of traits that nevertheless are quite rare. And in this uh, rarity of completely viable combinations of traits, and in this very strong lumpiness, this uh, granularity in the distribution species in the whole space, we find the hallmark of natural selection. And a little bit now of our own unnatural selection on top of it. Just a couple of words about um, where different families lie for the taxonomically oriented among you. Uh, here we picture the 10 most species families of vascular plants, of, uh, sorry, angiosperms. And you see, for example, very different patterns. The brown ones, the legumes, is the family with the widest functional diversity on Earth, according to our study. You see, it's all over. Uh, whereas the orchids, which are, have a huge number of species, probably almost as many or maybe more uh, as the legumes, you know, they are all restricted, functionally, they are all pretty much the same. And many other families are somewhere in between. Okay, these are, in a nutshell, what we found. Now, um, it's very, very simple. Some people think it's too simple. We are talking about six traits, pretty straightforward, pretty domestic, no high tech. We are talking only two axes, one plane, and two hotspots. Extremely simple. Some people find it too simple. Uh, we believe that the beauty of it is in simplicity. But it depends on how much of a lumper or a splitter you are, and it also depends on your particular objectives. And let me, let me give you an example. If you, your objective is to describe and understand and manage one particular bull, and you want to depict that bull, you probably want a hyper-realistic high resolution photo of that particular bull, right? But if you are interested in capturing the essence of what being a bull means, 
and you want that to be true and applicable in a very wide range of situations and areas, then you would probably go the Picasso way. Yeah? Picasso's bull doesn't make justice to any particular bull on Earth, but on the other hand, anybody on Earth will recognize this as a bull. So again, depending on your objective and your scale, this is good for you or probably too coarse and you need to um, zoom up. What we think is neat of it is that you can place any plant, any community or any lineage on earth in this space with only two quantitative coordinates based on very simple traits. Let me very quickly tell you about some applications and spin-offs of this. One obvious one is as an input of large-scale global vegetation models, DGVMs, or ecosystem models. Why is a good one? Because as I said, uh, you can capture the essential design of any vascular plant on Earth with just two quantitative continuous coordinates. So computationally, it's great. So some people tell me that it's, it's really good to, to be using it on their models. I'm not doing it because I just don't know how to do DGVMs. So this is not capturing my heart so far. But what is capturing my heart a little bit more is other spin-offs. One is trying to solve some or not solve, or help solving some questions about the evolution of functional syndromes on plant, uh, vascular plants. For example, today the topography of the spectrum is like this, but we suspect, we don't have the hard data yet, that this topography was very, very different a few million years ago. Probably some of these hotspots weren't there. Probably we have a hotspot much, much closer to here, and this was not there. And probably this wasn't there either. So we think it's a, it's a kind of neat way to understand evolution or to trace lineages. Um, the other thing that is close to my heart right now is how is functional diversity changing in the face of large-scale human drivers. Very recently, something like three months ago, we produced a large document, you probably saw it in the news, in which we found that, well, something that we, we quantified it at the global scale, but actually you probably already knew, about the scale, the dramatic scale of human drivers affecting life on Earth, including plants, climate, but land use, etc. These drivers have mean that very, very few areas on the world remain that can be considered technically wilderness. All the rest has our very strong stamp. So what we are doing to functional diversity is really relevant today. Um, I am teaming up with a number of uh, other initiatives, including PREDICTS, including um, SPLOT, trying to place not species but communities in the global spectrum. If you, if you think of the, the average traits of a whole community of plants, you can place the community in, in as the spectrum and see how the community shifts in the spectrum as it's affected by people, right? And this is what we are right now trying to do. But I don't have the, the data yet. So at, at least I don't have something I can show. So I just share with you some interesting patterns that can be seen at the species level, not community level, we, that we already found. We found that most of the plants that we eat 
and most of the plants with which we have been having fun and killing each other for the last two or three thousand years are all here. These are just example families. There are more families, of course. Are all confined to this highly specialized, highly acquisitive section of the spectrum. On the other hand, we find that there is another group of plants with completely opposite traits. These are really, you know, live fast, die young acquisitive plants. And these are really conservative, you know. I resist, 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 but once I'm killed, I cannot recover kind of guys. These plants, these are just example families, are basically losing the battle. They have been losing the evolutionary battle for a few million years, and now with large-scale land use change, they are really, really on the brink. So this is just an example of what we are doing to the global spectrum. Uh, so basically, all these guys that look all different, but in essence, they are all in the same uh, kind of this corner of the spectrum, are being very, very fast replaced by these kind of guys, which are very highly specialized as well, but completely opposite designs. OK, in summary, uh, the worldwide six trait design space of vascular plants is not, a, is not a blob. It's actually remarkably constrained and lumpy. It's not a blob, it's a pump cake. Uh, most of the variation is concentrated into just one plane, which we call the global spectrum of plant form and function, which is defined by just two main axes. One is size, and the other is tissue quality. The spectrum is also strongly granular, with strong convergence towards a relatively small set of successful trait combinations, and vast areas which are biomechanically viable, but not popular at all today on Earth. To us, this is the hallmark of natural selection. And this spectrum provides a backdrop, a navigational chart, if you want, on which you can analyze the trajectory of lineages. You can place any plant on Earth, including the ones which are not included in the original spectrum. And you can also help ecosystem models at several scales. And I would like to finish with a big, big thank to all these colleagues, without which all this work wouldn't possibly have been done. Thank you very much for your attention. Time for a couple of questions. So, raise your hand. Okay. Hola. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm a botanist and plant ecologist, so I need to thank you uh, for your work and also for making visible uh, our discipline and our topic. It's, I think, still very important and for the general public, but also for other people and for my children, and now they think I'm doing something that can be important as well. And I have like a general question for both of you. Probably you know that um, the United Nations declared um, next decade as the decade for ecosystem restoration. So uh, I think, I feel, and I know that what you are doing can be applied, but in, in the real world, how the restoration of ecosystems can can be addressed with uh, new super plants or with the, the um, functional perspective, or maybe you also know some, 
some examples or of the, the result from the panel of ecosystem and, and services is also talking about that. So your general impression, thank you. Okay, that's a great question, Borja. Um, um, okay, um, you you did it at different levels. Your question it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky question because it's few several questions in one. You cheated, so I will go into cheat too, with a long answer. Um, okay, uh, definitely I can see our science uh, with a lot to contribute to restoration. And I think that we need massive restoration. Any, all, the, all the scenarios of reasonable hope I saw uh, for the next 50 years, including the ones by the United Nations, etc., all of them include a battery of solutions, including restoration. None of them works without restoration. You, we need to do massive restoration. Of course, the best restoration we can do is leave those ecosystems which don't need any restoration, just need to be left alone, alone. That's the first one. Because we, so today we don't have the technology to restore them exactly as they are now. So leave them alone. Second, wherever restoration can proceed just by allowing natural regeneration, or maybe helping it a bit, but basically harnessing what is natural, what we used to call secondary succession, that's great. Now, in areas in which restoration has to be done mostly by us, because it's just over the, over the edge and it cannot just recover itself, then I think our science can help a lot. Joan can explain you you know, how she could use her super plants um, in these areas. So I, I won't comment on that. In my case, with natural with wild plants, which is what I understand, uh, I would say the global spectrum teaches you that you cannot restore a multi-potent uh, ecosystem everywhere you want. You have to choose. Because plants are highly constrained. They cannot, they cannot do everything. You cannot have in the same animal a cart horse and a race horse, right? You have to choose. You cannot have them in both. OK, with plants, it's the same. And therefore, with ecosystems, it's the same. You can get a, 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 a few ecosystem contributions to people. But you cannot have everything in the same ecosystem. You cannot mix all the ideal plants in an ecosystem. It doesn't work. This spectrum shows it doesn't work. Um, OK? I think you know, we have to do some informed restoration. I mean, the planet is changing really fast. We have to look at global you know, models for what the weather is going to be and try to get those plants ready for those climates, right? Because I don't think we can just put the old plants back where they used to be because you know, we've already lost 80% of all the seagrasses, you know, and we're losing typha and all these other plants, you know, that are land forming plants. So our shorelines are all going away. I think if we put plants, you know, we have these climate rooms that we felt were really necessary to have, but we can use the models that people are predicting are going to be our new weather patterns, and then try to create plants that are generalists and ones that are specialists, you know? One, a generalist being something that is going to survive and get some food for or whatever we're growing it for, no matter what the weather turned out to be. It'll be better than not doing anything to those seeds. And then, sorry. Okay, and then um, the specialist, you'd have to be really good at predicting the climate, I think. Because if you have a specialist and then you don't get that bad weather that you were predicting, you know, the old seeds would have been better, you know. So we're going to have to put all these things together. And I think informed restoration will involve, you know, creating climates of the future and putting in a whole bunch of varieties of the same species, say a whole bunch of seagrasses from all over the place, and see who wins, you know, when you have that climate. So I think informed restoration is going to be part of the answer anyway. 
So what do you think? I don't know, I'm not an ecologist, but. Okay. Hello. Well, first of all, <laughs> congratulations to you both, to Johan. I'm very glad to see you. And to you also, Sandra. I have a, a general comment. I think you are an example, you both as, are an example of functional diversification uh, as women in science. And I wonder if you guys have suffered uh, Darwinian struggle in selection along the way to reach here. Uh, I mean, how was, I, I have a general question about how was, uh, did you ever suffer some kind of a struggling situation as a women in science along your career to get in the position you are now? This is the first question. And a general question also in, in Europe, we are very worried about food security and uh, ensuring safety food. And you know, we are also very uh, against in different from America where you guys are coming from, we are against transgenics. And also there is a big debate ongoing on the CRISPR uh, technologies to edit crops. So I would like you to you have your general opinion on these aspects too. That's a big question. Yes, they're okay. even worse than yours. <laughs> yeah, very different. Uh, I, can, I, I cannot possibly comment on the crisp. Uh, that's definitely your territory, so I will try to get an extremely short answer uh, to the first part. No, I didn't have any um, unsurmountable obstacle to get where I am. I always work very, very hard. Uh, it wasn't easy, it was never easy, but I, no, I, I would be, I know there's a lot of um, really bad discrimination to people everywhere. Uh, I would have been unfair in my particular situation and I highlight my personal situation, I always got support. It was, I never asked for permission. That's probably why I didn't, I didn't have any obstacles. Uh, I probably, you know, I had this brutal kind of a single minded that very brutal approach and say, what do you mean an obstacle? Uh, this, I, I always worked very hard. I, I didn't ask for permission. Because, so probably I wasn't, uh, even if were, maybe they were obstacles and it wasn't aware. Um, um, I'm, I'm very kind of a stubborn. Uh, but again, I, that doesn't mean that these obstacles are not real. I think they are extremely real based on cultural background, gender, age, uh, where in the world you come from. Uh, I sometimes got discriminated because my English wasn't considering good enough, things like that. But I would be, I cannot say that, you know, there were just big scars that impeded me personally to get where I, I think that I just push for it. And if you ask me what I would advise, I would say just go for it. Just don't ask for permission, just don't ask to have permission to think groundbreaking ideas, just go for it. The no, you already have. So try for, for the yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I haven't really had an insurmountable obstacle either. Except, I mean, I don't know. You can look at your life in different compartments, right? I have four brothers, so I have a thick skin because they were like so mean to me, much meaner than any scientist I ever met. You know, they, I, they were, we were all around the same age, and I, you know, four of them picked on me constantly. And so, you know, so I had to deal with that. All right, that's one thing. <laughs> What's my next compartment? Is it worse being a woman scientist or a plant scientist at a biomedical institute? I mean, I think at Salk, the real bias is against plants more than women who do plants. Right? <laughs> so anyway, it's just all biology has become biomedicine in the United States. And so, if I keep calling myself a plant biologist, I don't think about myself being a woman who is studying biology, right? I, just, I relate to the plant part of the biologist. And so and there is that aspect too. And I also agree, you have to just go out there, you know? So anytime, if you're a woman in science, anytime your department has an at-home 
symposium, you get yourself in that thing and show people that you know, you're excited about your science. Because in the end, that's all that really matters to scientists, I think, overall. You know, just keep the conversation on science. You don't go to those other bad places, necessarily. And so that's the advice I often give young women, just because I think, you know, as a young woman, you know, people look at you as a woman. As an old woman like me, I'm invisible. You know, I can do whatever I want now because I'm just completely invisible. And so anyway, so I just do what I want to do. But young women get treated like girls or women, you know. And so you have to just keep the conversation on science. Work hard to keep it on science because I think in the end, science is like science, right? So, all right. <laughs> And then, what did you want to know about CRISPR? <laughs> I'm a little worried about these embryos that are being made by one of your Spanish colleagues, okay? I don't know, who's also at my institute. I mean, there's a lot of ethical questions that are gonna come up with CRISPR. They're gonna be way more serious than GMOs, if you ask me. But you know, anything we all do can have unanticipated consequences. And so if your institution is doing that kind of experiment, you really should have a risk assessment committee and you should have ethicists involved and they should talk to you as scientists, right? I, I just think, you know, with the whole GMO issue, we want an ethicist involved in our project, for instance, right? Because people get really upset about GMO. And so you have to deal with it even if you think it's not harmful, like I don't have a particular bias against it. But you know, a lot of people do, so you have to respect that. So, and ethicists can help you think about unanticipated consequences. Because you know, I'm saying we're gonna have a global effect. Well, what if we overshoot, you know? I mean, we can do something bad to the whole, everybody who lives on the planet. We're all playing God just a little bit, I think. And so you gotta be careful about that stuff. That's all what I have to say about CRISPR. I mean, CRISPR's great, but you know, what you can do with it, you have to think about it. You don't, don't just do it because you can. Right? <laughs> all right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Muchas gracias a todos.